As a, as a little kid in, in Sunday school, I, I remember the story of the fiery furnace being performed many, many times uh, over at our Sunday school prize giving nights. I'm, I'm sure probably you've seen it once or twice, right? I think that and the story of Daniel in the lion's den, uh, some of the classics, right, um, that we would perform as far as Sunday school plays are concerned. In fact, my twin uh, four-year-old daughters were absolutely adorable lions um, in the Daniel in the Lion's Den play just last year. And these are all incredibly well-known stories, stories that speak to us about faith and God's salvation in the most dramatic of ways. And really, that's what Daniel chapter 3 is all about. We're sort of confronted with this extremely harrowing scenario. It's the story, isn't it, of three young Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are essentially thrown into a blazing inferno by the most powerful man on the planet. That's King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And this is because they refuse to bow down to a giant 90-foot glistening golden statue. And without a doubt, without a doubt, that golden statue was most likely uh, crafted in the king's own image. And if you're struggling to sort of visualize the sort of stature and the height or the scale of the statue, then just take a look at that. It's the... It's the uh, statue that appears in Brazil uh, in Rio de Janeiro. It's called Christ the Redeemer, actually, and it stands at about 38 metres tall, um, and you would say that, that the size of, a ne of Nebuchadnezzar's golden image was pretty much like that, probably just minus the plinth there. And it's obvious from the dream that he had back in chapter 2 that Nebuchadnezzar was recreating what he saw, right? So perhaps he had a little bit of amnesia. I mean, some time had passed here, but instead of making an accurate representation um, of the head of gold in which he was, what did he do? He made the whole statue gold, didn't he? Not just the head. It really was quite a defiant maneuver. You know, his empire was going to be the everlasting empire. He would be the god that every nation and tongue would bow to. He would be, Nebuchadnezzar would be the great unifier. He would be the rock that fills the earth and stands forever. And so you have these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were essentially doing what? They were sowing discord, sowing discord. They were messing up the unity that Nebuchadnezzar was creating. They were essentially, as we would say, throwing a spanner in the works. And it was a dire situation that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego found themselves in. So if anything at all, the story of the fiery furnace is all about... Where does our loyalty lie? Where does our allegiance lie? And how far would you and I be prepared to go to uphold that loyalty and allegiance? I mean, are we loyal? Are we aligned to the only true God? It's a really important question we need to ask. Or do we actually split our allegiance and our loyalties up to other gods? And if so, what are those other gods? So that's one of the key messages from the story of Daniel chapter 3. And what's more, uh, these three individuals, despite the absolute horror of what lay before them, this blazing inferno, they were actually, actually prepared to die such a death because they would rather die than betray the only true God who loved them and promised to protect them. So there's a bit of a summary for you. 
Now, of course, there is so much more to this story, and I'm actually quite terrified that I'm really not going to get to the end of this. So, um, but that is the essence of it. Now, as I contemplated this scenario, there were some additional questions that were sort of floating around in my mind, one of which was this one. What am I willing to die for, right? If a terrifying scenario like this was presented before me, would I be willing to die a death like these three men for my loyalty to the only true God? It's a massive question. Or would I, at the appropriate time, have looked down at my shoes when the music was blasting and bowed down to tighten my laces? I may have. To put it simply, would I have crumbled and bowed to save my own life? What about you? What would you be willing to die for? And it actually prompted me to ask this question. Do you actually think about death? Do you think about dying? Does it ever cross your mind? Now, I really can't speak for everyone, but I do think that, generally speaking, that when we're young, we feel a sense of invincibility, don't you think? Um, death is sort of like this nebulous concept. We know it happens and we're extremely shocked when we hear of it, especially if that person is very close to us or that person dies at such a young age. But in regard to our own selves, death just doesn't seem real when we're young. And so if we are of a healthy mind, we rarely fixate on death. But I tell you what, as you grow older, the reality of death becomes a much more tangible and real thing. We're actually less likely to do the death-defying things that we did as young people. And if I could get a dollar for the amount of times I've, I've, I've lost count of the downhill mountain bike injuries that I've heard over the last two years, um, I would be a, a very wealthy man, or at least $5 richer. But when you have your own kids in particular, um, you feel a much greater sense of responsibility to remain alive and to remain intact um, for their benefit. You know, as a father, I don't want to leave my kids um, fatherless through a reckless moment of, of unmerited invincibility, for instance. And that could also be an excuse for me not being physically active as well. But that is another story. Um, and so I ask the question again to you. Do you think about death? Are you prepared for it? And, and I, I'm sorry to bring up what seems like such a morbid topic so early in the talk, but actually, these are really, really important questions to ask. Why? Because for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, death, their death, was staring them potentially in the face because they did not want to betray their God. You know, the Apostle Paul says that it's an extremely rare thing for a human to give up their life for someone else. You know the passage I'm, I'm probably referring to. It's, it's in Romans chapter 5, verse 7. It says this, it goes... For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, perhaps, for a good man, someone might dare, even, would even dare to die. That's what it says. But of course, God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So, it might be, therefore, that for you know, for the, for the good character of, of a deeply admired and a, a virtuous person that you or I might say, or a person might say, yes, I'm willing to die for you, or I pledge my allegiance to you, even if it means that my life might end. Someone might do that. But Paul is saying that it is extremely rare 
for someone to do a thing like that. And what's more, the person that we are dying for would have to be deserving of such a sacrifice. Because a person would never contemplate sacrificing themselves for an unworthy person unless they were forced into it. And we can think of millions of people who have died in war, who have died for causes that are not worthy of such a sacrifice. Wars under the guise of freedom that are actually, when we discover it, all about human greed, economic gain or power. But here, Jesus willingly laid down his life for us, didn't he? And he didn't lay down his life for virtuous people, but for sinners, for individuals who did nothing to merit or deserve such an act of kindness or love. Even for us here, who were powerless, it says, or, or were not yet born, who didn't exist, it says that Christ died for us too, okay? And so Jesus wasn't coaxed into it. He died willingly for us. And here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to die because God, the only true God who saves, was worthy of their sacrifice. And I think that's the question that we should ask ourselves as well. It's certainly the question that I've been asking myself. Do we see God as 100% worthy of our sacrifice, of our daily sacrifice? Is God worthy of our love? Is God worthy of our energy, of our passions? Is he worthy of our time? Is he worthy of our labours? And by the way, is our sacrifice a sacrifice of joy? Or is it something that we do begrudgingly? It's a, it's a question we, we ask. Like, for instance, honestly, ask yourself the question, are you here begrudgingly? Are you thinking, oh, why, Luke? Why did we have to have that particular speaker? I mean, you might be here begrudgingly. But for these three young men, in front of them now was this enraged king. In his fury, he sentenced them to die by this terrifying inferno of flames. And so what I want to do is I just want to talk a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about these young men for a couple of minutes. And, and I think it's probably likely that in other classes you would already know this, but, but it, I think it's really important to re-emphasize what I'm about to say. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were young, right? They weren't old, they were young. And, and when they were taken into the house of King Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 1, they were just boys, really. They were teenagers, probably no more than 15 or 16 years old. They were real young. And we don't actually know exactly how much time passed from chapter 1 to chapter 3, but it's quite possible, it's quite possible that they might have been in their early 30s, the same age, of course, that Jesus was throughout his ministry, which would be a fascinating comparison of which I've heard. But there's no doubt about it. They were young. They were young people, really, in their absolute prime. Their absolute prime. And not only this, these boys were handpicked as the, have you heard this expression before, the, the creme de la creme. The creme de la creme as far as intellect and as far as wisdom is concerned. In, in simplicity, they were super smart. They were really like the one percenters, the, the, the superstars of MIT or or Harvard, um, or Stanford University. They were extremely gifted young men. And, you know, not only this, Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, says unequivocally that they were extremely handsome as well. Extremely handsome. They were good-looking. In fact, actually, you'll notice that their outward appearance is acknowledged first. Take a listen, or have a read. It says they were young men in whom there was no blemish. Basically, they were without physical defect. They were flawless, stunning, 
good looking. And then it says that they were gifted in all wisdom. They were possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve in the king's palace, whom they might teach the language and literature, literature of the Chaldeans. And we might go, yeah, good looking, handsome, intelligent. Yep, here we go. And, and there will be a point to this. So these three boys, and I'm building it up, incredibly handsome, super smart. And it's important to highlight it because society back then, as it does today, values those two things pretty much above all of other things. Good looks, intelligence. Good looks, intelligence. And actually, here's the facts. In our world, good looks are treated as a virtue, right? If you're stunning to look at, you've almost got a rite of passage in this life. You've almost got the golden ticket in this world if you wish to exploit it. And people use their good looks to advance themselves in the world all the time. And actually, the world encourages it. Just consider the obsession with celebrity as a classic example of it. Look at the actors, look at the entertainers, look at the musicians, or, or anyone that's got a significant social media following or profile. You know, externals are really placed on a massive pedestal. You know, consider cosme cosmetics and plastic surgery that, that, that goes on to en enhance a celebrity's looks to make that person look more youthful or more attractive or beautiful. Consider advertising. They're not really interested in average-looking people, are they, to advance their brands or products. So as humans, we, we place, and the world places, an inordinate amount of value on externals, on good looks, on beauty, on physical attraction. And, OK, for those that are not born with celebrity-like aesthetics, and I would, I would definitely include myself in that, well, we sometimes wished we looked a lot better. Because maybe life would be easier and better. Maybe we'd find a job quicker. Maybe we'd find a boyfriend. Maybe we'd find a girlfriend, right? Sometimes we can feel like it's just not fair that others have all the looks and we don't. You don't have to agree but I know, being a young person with a phone, no, <laughs> I know from being a young person, sorry. Um, <laughs> social media? No. Um, but I know what it's like to be a young person. I know what it's like being a 46-year-old and still being conscious about how ghastly my hair is looking right now and how dowdy I feel. See, we obsess over this, don't we? We do. You probably obsessed a little bit over the way that you looked coming to SCYP today, right? Now, even the prophet Samuel from the Old Testament had to be reminded of this by God, didn't he? Because when Samuel was told to anoint the next king, you know, the second king, basically one of the sons of Jesse, he immediately saw Eliab. And what did he see? He saw this tall, good-looking fellow and basically he thought, ah, he's got all of the external kingly qualities that humans so desire. You know, just like King Saul was, the first king. He was, as it says, he was head and shoulders above the rest. He was tall, dark and handsome. But God said to Samuel, no, uh-uh. Don't look at his outward appearance. Don't look at his appearance. Don't do that. Don't look at his physical stature, his height. Because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, you see. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart, right? See, we make all con kinds of wrong assumptions by what we see on the outside. I mean, look, from up here on the stage, I'm looking at you all at the moment, very respectable, you all look like very moral human beings to me by what, you, what you're wearing, quite frankly. You look good. But actually, underneath that respectable attire, 
We know, and God knows, that there is a heart that is deceitful above all things, and it's desperately wicked, right? So who you really are can actually be hidden under a wholesome exterior. Absolutely nothing wrong with looking neat and tidy. It's actually a really good thing, biblical, to be modest, isn't it? But let's not forget that God sees what's really going underneath the hood. Good looks might get you places in the world, but it holds no sway with God. And you know what? And the reason why I'm laboring this point is because I think it's an important one in today's society with the way that social media is. And that's why I want to hammer this point home to you, because I think it's really critical. See, God proves that externals hold no sway to him in the most dramatic of ways. And do you know how he shows that? He shows it in the way that he made his son. Did you know that Jesus wasn't good looking? Did you know that? Anyone? Did you know that? He wasn't. He wasn't like Chris Hemsworth. He wasn't a Brad Pitt. I mean, these are familiar names to us. And actually, Isaiah makes the most startling point about the physical appearance of God's only son. Have a listen to to this. In Isaiah 53 verse 2, it says that he had no beauty, none of it, nothing, no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. There was nothing about him physically that that would attract us to him. Nothing. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. No beauty, no majesty, no attraction, nothing that we should desire him. That's pretty amazing, isn't it, don't you think? In fact, he was the antithesis, or he was the opposite of what we would hope or expect from a fleshly point of view. Deliberately so. Deliberately so. And then it goes on to say, real sadly, doesn't it, that he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hid their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. So Jesus was well below average looking. You could actually confidently say he was ugly. In fact, at the point of his death, and you're going to be gutted to hear this, in Isaiah 52, verse 14, it says that his appearance was so marred, his face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And and from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Have you ever felt average before? Have you ever felt plain or or ugly? And I know I've felt that way, and I know that we all feel that way. Then think of Jesus Christ. He knows exactly how you feel. He knows what it's like to be rejected by a world that only cares about externals, just like King Nebuchadnezzar did. I mean, what did he do? He built a giant golden image to himself, 90 feet tall representation of himself for all to bow down to like a god and so that's why one of the reasons why we love jesus because our esteem is wrapped up in in him and here's the important thing if our character and our heart begins to reflect the character and the heart of his son jesus then to our heavenly father what do we look like He sees us as the most adorable, the most beautiful children in the world. How good's that? I mean, what parent, what parent doesn't look over their child, whether the child's got funny looking ears like Frankie does, or or whatever that is, one of my children. She's absolutely adorable in our eyes. And that's what God thinks of us who are his, who love his despised and his rejected son, 
the one who had no physical attraction or beauty that we should desire him. You know, I tell you what, it is a really, really fascinating study, and you may want to do it, but it's a fascinating study to track all the times good-looking people are referred to in the Bible. It's a really interesting study. I started to go down the rabbit hole on this. Um, and how God, at times, has actually used or aligned his will through the utility of human beauty and attractiveness. It's really amazing. It's such a massive topic. And actually, you can't help but draw the parallel of, of this story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, picked for their beauty and intellect. You can't help but draw the attraction between Esther. Has anyone... I mean, surely you would have made that connection before, right? What about her? She was fair and she was beautiful. Absolutely stunning. It says that she was beautiful of form and face, and people were just struck, awestruck, by the beauty of this Jewish woman. And she, of course, got the attention of King Ahasuerus, who immediately just fell in love with her. She was stunning, right? And very much like the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was a conspiracy against the Jews to destroy them that God was going to overturn through the faith of this incredibly beautiful woman. Because, why? Because God knows what humans value. He knows what we value. He knows what the world values. So Esther's physical beauty positioned her in the king's courts as queen. It did. And through this, Esther triggered a decree through the help of God that protected and preserved the Jewish people from extermination. That's the story. It's so similar in many respects to our story. Now, Esther was willing to risk it all. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were willing to risk it all, right? But how easy would it have been for both Esther and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to, for their luxurious lifestyles to alter her thinking or their thinking and their faith? It would have been a massive challenge, right? Would you think? I think it would have. You know, Jesus says in Luke 12, verse 48, he says this, he says, to whom much is given, much will be required. Okay? So for the people that we're talking about tonight, much was given, right? It's true. Much was given and much was required. And boy, did they give, okay? So for all of us who have been given exceptional talents or exceptional things, and whatever that may be, it might be with good looks. It may be. It might be with your intelligence. It might be with your gift for mathematics. It might be in the sciences. Or it might be, in my case, in the arts. Much is required of, of us with exceptional talent in the service of our God, right? And personally speaking, I, I have needed to remind myself time and time again about this with the skill sets that I've got. And if any of you know or don't know what I do, I, it, it's, it's art, right? Because I'm abs like, I would say, almost chronically disabled, honestly, when it comes to anything related to academia. Like the other day I was in the hospital um, and I was taking Frankie, uh, no, Olive, the other one, um, <laughs> the other one to hospital to, to, for an operation. And the woman asked me, she says, what's your daughter's uh, middle name? And I was like, oh, I, actually, I don't know. <laughs> and I called Julia up and said, Julia, actually, what's the middle name of Olive? Uh, right. And she, Kate, yeah. And then they were like, and birth date, please. And I'm like, oh, uh, yeah. So anyway, I uh, had to call Julia up again. And there was a third thing, and I think a fourth thing, anyway. That proves the point, doesn't it? When it comes to academia, mathematics, I struggle to even remember my children's birthday. But what I am good at is I'm good at art. I'm very good at art. I'm not good at a lot of other things, but I can do art. I can draw pictures and I can play music. I can. And one thing I would say 
this. I would say this one thing about the arts. Unless there is a provision for these types of God-given talents in our Christadelphian community, then the world snatches up people like me or people like you that have the same skills. It snatches us up. It, the world carves a place out for people with those skills because it was the artists, wasn't it? It was the musicians in the time of Babylon who were appointed to create this unifying experience, wasn't it? This unifying atmosphere and emotion that preempted the worship of a dumb idol. And just imagine it, as the flames bellowed, right? And, and as an artist, I'm imagining, as the flames bellowed, you can imagine the light from that blaze just shimmering and making that golden statue shimmer and shine with the fire of that furnace. And from an artistic point of view, it was an art director's dream to set up such a spectacular scene. It was a cinematic experience for all to see. It was theatrical. It was like the Oscars of Babylon, right? And Nebuchadnezzar was the big winner. Okay, on the flip side, also remember King David, okay? Now, it was King David who orchestrated one of the most magnificent, magnificent musical movements in Israel's history, back in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 25. So when it came to King David, a man after God's own heart, he was a prolific musician, wasn't he? Amazing player of the harp and lyre, soothed Saul's um, troubled heart and mind, didn't he? And David created projects for those who could construct and play instruments to the honour and praise of God. And David also wanted to build a magnificent temple, the most beautiful temple for God, with the utility of artists, right? And craftspeople with immense skill. Because David knew how the arts stirred the hearts and the emotions within us to the praise and the adoration of God. You know, that's encapsulated in Psalm 150. In fact, I've written a song with these words in mind, but basically it's praise him with the trumpet sound, okay? Very similar instruments that were actually used here in Babylon. Praise him with the trumpet sound, praise him with the lute and harp, praise him with the tambourine, and praise him with dance, interesting. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals, ah. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And I'm telling you, that is what Nebuchadnezzar wanted to do. Let everything that has breath praise me, is what he was saying, wasn't he? Right? But that's not our purpose, is it, with our skills that we've got. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And so I'm really thankful, really, and it's a funny kind of image here. I'm really thankful that we have brought to life important creative ventures like the Sunday School Footsteps projects that you will eventually find out about, uh, to name one of several, actually, and other creative initiatives for musicians, for actors, for singers, and various other brothers and sisters to add valuable contributions to our community in our collective walk to the kingdom. See, David didn't suppress the contribution of, these, of those with talents, did he? Didn't do it. He found a role for everyone to take part in the worship of God. So that's a positive spin that I wanted to give you on that. Because I could go down a negative path if you want me to. I could go, all right, music, pumping music that brings you all together in the name of idolatry. We know where those places are. But here is where we want to be. We could be anywhere tonight, couldn't we? But we're here. And so, for, and so I'm very thankful for that. And so for Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, the world was their oyster. But here they were. They were refusing to bow down to this glistening image, which meant death. And it's all because certain Jew-hating Chaldeans went to the king and accused them of not bowing down. That's what it says here. 
There are certain Jews... Oh, by the way, how's everyone going? Is everyone okay? Are you with me still? Thumbs up? Good. Excellent. In the back there? Very good. Um, so they said, they said to the king, they said, there are certain Jews whom you, King Nebuchadnezzar, have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not paid their due regard to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you've set up. You see, these three young men were, were put into major positions of power. They oversaw the affairs of the province of Babylon. It was a position of privilege. So just appreciate for a few seconds here what these young men were prepared to give up. A budding career, wealth, status, security. And yet for a higher calling, they were willing to prematurely end their own lives and their own earthly aspirations. Have aspirations for a reasonable job do? To do well at school? To advance yourself in this life? Well, here they were going, we're at our peak and we're prepared to end it all. In fact, Hebrews 11 verse 25 says that they, choosing rather to suffer affliction, weren't they, with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. So what does the king say? Now just for a minute, just, ima just imagine King Nebuchadnezzar talking directly to you, okay? He goes, is this true? Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image which I've set up? Is it true? It's almost like he preempted them for saying, no, it's not true. So now, now, if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, and the psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, then good. That, that's how he said it, Can't, I would say, a little bit like that. Now, I just want to pause there just for a, a minute. Let me just rephrase it a bit. Um, the king was saying, listen, guys, Look, I'll give you a second chance here, okay? Second chance. All smarmy-like and arrogant. To satisfy me, all you've got to do is just bow. It's no big deal. Just join in. Assimilate. Don't kick up a stink. Don't rattle the cage. Just put your values aside and unify, okay? Don't embarrass me. Don't embarrass yourself. Look around. Everyone else is doing it. So why aren't you? And if you do what I'm asking, then good, that's excellent. You can continue to govern the affairs of this great empire. And actually, you'll go up in the world. I'll assure you of that. Right? That's kind of the way I, I read this to me. And we'll pause there. And I would just say that that here's the challenge for us, for me and for you. What are we succumbing to today, do you think? Do you think there are some dangers out there at the moment that we might be succumbing to? What are the threats? What types of values are we allowing ourselves to cave in to because the world says it's okay? I had to think about this a fair bit, and I think maybe you're a little bit younger, but I would just say that there would be, this is going to be something that's going to affect you terribly. Now, you've heard of cancel culture, right? It just nod, cancel culture. You're all young people, so you would know about this, cancel culture. So you know with cancel culture being such a key issue these days that people are frightened to be seen as intolerant. It's, you know, it's weird. Tolerance seems to be heralded as the great virtue today, doesn't it? Tolerance. Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Doesn't seem like a very loving word, though. Like, I don't go to my wife and I say, Julia, I tolerate you. <laughs> you know what I mean? But the world just elevates this word, tolerance. So people are frightened to be seen as intolerant to certain minority groups that are being elevated in society like we've never, ever seen before. I'll give you one clear and obvious example. It's the LGBTQ 
community. Have you? Uh, yeah. And it's now becoming one of the most, the most powerful minorities to infiltrate education, to infiltrate entertainment, and to infiltrate the workplace in general. And we've all heard of the campaign Black Lives Matter, right? Which seeks to educate and eradicate racism, okay? And that's been dominating the news for months. And I doubt there would be anyone here, anyone here, who would, who would ever encourage that type of behaviour of racism. And I'm telling you right now, it's one of the things that I am looking forward to most when Christ returns. I am. But that's being used, and the sentiments of that are being used terribly because of the political mandates that sit behind the hood, right? Because some of the principles and the mandates that sit behind BLM is a policy to actually dismantle and disrupt the traditional nuclear family. Do you know what I mean by that? The traditional nuclear family? What that is, the nuclear family is being a father and a mother and their children all in one household. That's what it means. Okay? And one of the mandates there, the policies, is to dismantle the nuclear family as being wholesome and good. You think, what? What's that got to do with racism? Nothing. And there's a reason for this. Because from the start of the movement, the foundations of BLM have always put, and this is really, really important, they have always put LGBTQ voices at the centre of the conversation. Which is why homosexuality, bisexuality and transgenderism is gaining such a massive voice at the moment. Why? Why? Because if you strategically associate racism with the oppression of other minorities, they too will be elevated normalised and celebrated in society. Does that make sense? Okay, makes sense? Nods, lots of nods everywhere. And, and there is no reason at all, from a worldly point of view, as to why the average person would have any issue with this. Because the moral fabric of society is growing more and more atheistic by the day. What's the big deal? Love is love. They can do whatever they want as long as it just doesn't affect me, right? But for us here, all of us, who cling on to the morals of God, it's a firestorm at the moment. It's a firestorm. And I use that because I want to reference it to what's happening with the uh, fiery furnace. It's become a government mandate. It's a government mandate for companies and for individuals to be inclusive, to be tolerant, and in many instances, a champion for these minorities. And in the entertainment sector, you are actually given funding preferences if you tick all the boxes of inclusion, right? LGBTQ being right up there, right up there as a high principle. And I'm not saying, of course, that we should abandon the Christ-like principles of love, towards though that we morally disagree with, not at all. But consider the absolute hypocrisy of these mandates in the new wave of tolerance that's hitting us at the moment. See, if you don't bow down to the ascendancy of these minorities, they will burn you. They will burn you. Not so much with literal fire, but an inferno of words through social media. They will ruin your reputation. They will take away your funding. They will expose and destroy your businesses. It's happening everywhere. You will become a story of intolerance, a story of hate speech for not conforming to the new morality of this world. And there's not a thing that you can really do about that when it comes to the wave of what's happening in the world. So basically, just bow, right or wrong. It's madness. 
and it's getting worse, like the days of Lot. I didn't realize, I didn't realize probably five years ago that this is the way it would happen, that this is the way that the days of Lot would come about. This is really interesting, and it's quite terrifying. But where were we? That's what Nebuchadnezzar basically said to these three men. If you don't worship, you will be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. I'm going to cancel you. I'll cancel you. I'll snuff you out in an instant. And in all honesty, I, I really don't think that Nebuchadnezzar thought that these three men would resist him. I think he was pretty confident that they'd actually cave in. I mean, intimidation through fear is a pretty powerful device, don't you think? It's been used throughout the years, throughout the ages. But get a load of what Nebuchadnezzar says next. He goes, he sort of caps it off by saying, well, who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Right? See, it was a direct challenge, wasn't it? Direct challenge to the creator of all things. If he knew the only true God, he would never have tempted God in such a flippant and arrogant way. But we've got to remember something. Nebuchadnezzar had learned, all that Nebuchadnezzar had actually learned from the God of Daniel and the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego was that God was a revealing God. He reveals things. As Daniel said in, back to, in chapter 2, it says, The God of heaven has made known the dream and the interpretation. He revealed to Daniel what the astrologers and the magicians could not. See, Nebuchadnezzar had not yet seen, he had not yet understood that their God was also a deliverer. Also a deliverer. But he soon would. And so how did Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego respond? Well, they, re they actually responded pretty respectfully, don't you think? And actually with a fair bit of integrity, immense integrity. They said, O Nebuchadnezzar, verse 16 of chapter 3, if you're looking at it. Um, o Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. That's a pretty interesting thing to say, don't you reckon? O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. Then he says, but if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Wow. I mean, what an answer, don't you think? That's a pretty amazing answer. And, and there's just way too much and to, to talk about, to, to even possibly cover this in any... Oh, oh my. Um, I just looked at the time. Are you okay? You're good? All right. As, as if I paused to get everyone's opinion on that. Um, <laughs> I just want to say this, is that the first thing that we need to, to understand in this pretty amazing statement is that these men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, already knew, they already knew what their answer was well before they answered. And they didn't try to rationalize their way out of this predicament, did they? Because they had integrity. I mean, they could have used, and remember, they were smart, they could have used their God-given intellect to rationalize a reason for bowing down. Let me just give you some examples, and you might have some that you can think of yourself, but first one is, yeah, we're bowing down, but we're not really worshiping. Uh, it's just an act. It doesn't mean anything. I mean, it might look like it, but we're not. Perfectly good rationalization from a human point of view. Number two, well, the Bible says he's the king, and we are to respect governments and we are to obey authorities. So yeah, we will bow down because it's a good thing to be respectful. Not a bad justification, that's a pretty good one, don't you think? Third, another response could be, well, there's just so many other people bowing, then who's gonna notice? I mean, really, I'm just an anonymous, anonymous passenger. So that for the sake of peace, I'll bow. No one will see me, no one will care. Plus, God is a forgiving God. And I'm sure he'll understand. 
That's not a bad rationalisation. You could see someone doing that. I could see myself doing that. And finally, and I think that this one here is the one that, as a father, as a parent, I think that I would struggle with the most. And it may have been that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were eunuchs. It's possible that they couldn't actually have kids. But as a father point of view, I think I'd use this one. It's better for me to stay alive for the sake of my kids, right? Look, I'll bow down also so I can continue to be a witness for God in the king's courts. I'll stay alive to preach. I mean, we can justify this thing. We could do it if we wanted to, right? And no doubt there were fellow Jews that were in that crowd, that big crowd, who bowed. And you can imagine how cowardly, perhaps, they must have felt to see these incredible men, these incredible men, make a stand for their God. And, and when I think about it, I feel ashamed for the amount of times that I've rationalised some of the things that I've done to, to, to avoid or justify the things that I've done. I'm, I'm certain, since you're all human, you have too. Compromised. So what about you, young people? Are you justifying things that you know are upsetting our Heavenly Father who bought you with a price, who bought me with a price? You see, these men already had an answer. Why? Because they had committed to what they had believed since their youth. They didn't waver. They weren't tossed to and fro by the ways of doubt. They, weren't form they didn't get up there and formulate ideas on the spot. Uh, 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 uh. No, they already had a foundation already set in place for the things that they believed. And that's a big point they would not be moved. They built their house upon a rock. And who was that rock? It was the same rock that would actually strike that image at the feet and obliterate it and fill the whole earth and stand forever. See, I reckon that that vision that was in Daniel chapter 2 would have been a significant anchor for these three men to hold on to. And I believe that they held on Jesus the rock with a vice-like grip. But what else did these three young men have to solidify their faith and give them a sense of calm throughout this firestorm? And I'm probably going to have to end on this, and I, 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 which may be an excellent thing for most of you. Um, it was probably, it was most likely, I think it was definitely, actually, the prophetical message of Isaiah chapter 43. And if any of you are writing anything down, um, it's to have a read of Isaiah chapter 43 because it's the parallel chapter to this. So, and it was written about 125 years before they were taken into captivity, okay? So 125 years ago. Because God, through the prophet Isaiah, had been preparing the generation who would be taken into captivity into Babylon. That's what Isaiah, and specifically Isaiah 43, is all about. It's actually the most magnificent chapter. And, and in verse 2 of chapter 43, it says that God specifically mentions that they will be saved through fire and flame. Okay? Verse 1 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Pause there. Nebuchadnezzar, what had he done? I mean, what did he do? That wasn't very good English. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar had renamed them, hadn't he? He changed all their names. But God had not forgotten their names or his promises to them. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. I know your names and you are mine. Verse 2 says that when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And you can think of the Red Sea. You can think of Jordan. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze, even though they were fully clothed in all the rush of it. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. So, 
like, I, I, when I say young people, it, it feels awkward and odd to me because I know I'm in the casing of a 46-year-old um, male, but I, I still feel young, um, so it feels odd. But nevertheless, dear young people, <laughs> it's a simple lesson that we've got to remind ourselves time and time again. It's this one, okay? Faith, faith, and, and I'm talking about the type of faith that you're seeing in this chapter. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. See, these young men recounted and they committed to memory the promises of God. They read the Bible all the time. They knew the Ten Commandments. They knew what the first one was. You know, no other gods before me. Second one, right, is to have no graven images. Don't bow down to anything that you make. They knew that. They understood it. And they held them as principles that they never, ever contravened. But I'm telling you, without the knowledge of God's promises, without the knowledge of his word, they were completely and utterly lost. And for us, without the constant renewing and washing of our minds in God's spirit word, and I say spirit word specifically, that we have no chance of standing tall. We will crumble and we will bow every time. Now, there is a, there is a um, video that I wanted to show you. It's super powerful. It's super powerful. Has anyone seen this before? This is good. There's, no one has hardly seen this before. But I, I, I don't want to end here, but I'm going to. But, but I just want to say this before you watch it. Jesus says this. He says in John 6, verse 63, he says, My words, my words are spirit and my words are life. Okay, that's what Jesus says. Think about that. My words are spirit and life. So it makes perfect sense that the constant reading of the word of God will change your life. Because his words are spirit. And his words are life. See, God's words, they're not just, just, they're not just black and white words sitting in your gorgeous Bible. They're not. They, what they are is God's words hold power. Absolute power. It has the power to transform you into a young man or into a young woman of integrity and honour. It's God's promise to you and I. Now, I think that it's worth watching this. A recent study by the Center for Bible Engagement, where they pulled 40,000 uh, uh, general population in the U.S. from 8 to 80, and they just wanted to see how we are engaging with Scripture. Right. And they discovered something that actually became kind of the profound discovery of the entire study. It, they weren't even looking for this, and this is kind of became the highlight of the study. Right. Um, when we're in the scripture one time a week, and that could be church on Sunday. That's pastor saying you open your Bible, we hear the message. One time a week had negligible effect on some key areas of your life. So I'll, I'm going to spell that out more here in a moment. Two times a week negligible effect now at three times a week there was a blip on the map like there was a heartbeat something happened again a heartbeat okay. but here was the profound discovery when we're in the scripture four times a week it literally spikes off the chart you would expect that it'd be one two th i mean there'd be a gradual incline right. on the effect and impact that would have in your life but it was literally one two three four something radically happens okay you got my curiosity to this what, extent what kind of behavior is being affected feeling lonely drops 30 percent wow Ang like four times a week in the four bible. times a week in the bible okay anger issues drop 32 percent uh bitterness in relationships marriage a relationship with your kids and so on drops 40 percent alcoholism drops 57 percent feeling spiritually stagnant you know if there was one area when i'm talking with people that that they'll be honest about is they just feel spiritually stagnant ask them the question how much time are you spending in scripture if they're in the scripture four times a week or more it drops 60 percent wow 
Viewing pornography dropped 61 percent. That's very important. Now, on a flip positive side, sharing your faith wow. jumps 200 percent. Wow. Because you have a confidence in God's word. And then discipling others jumps 230 percent. That's that's amazing right there.